I'm Steve from This Week with Cars, and with me today is Ken Grazing from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. You might have thought that all I do is work on barn fine sprites, but that isn't the case. For the last five or so years, I've been building these three cars for Ken, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, I had accumulated a number of sprites. I started with a 1960 sprite and couldn't decide what I was going to do with it, whether I wanted to build it stock, as a rally car, or as a race car. So ultimately I ended up with a number of them, and we could build one of each. Now, the cars that we're building are not cars that are regular street cars. These all have historical, maybe not significance, but they're replicas of historically significant cars. Is that correct? That's correct. We I don't want to build something out of thin air, I pattern the cars after original cars. They are not original, but they're very close replications. We work hard at making cars that uh, replicate the original cars with the intent that they perform like the original cars. I don't like to cut up cars that might be a pr preservation class car, so I use uh, tubs that we found in the desert or, or found you know, basically barn fine type cars and build from there um, and build them up as, as replicas of historic cars. And not only do the cars look like replicas of the historic cars, but you have spent many years tracking down the historical parts to build them correctly. That's right. We try to use as much new old stock parts and we try to go find original racing components as would have been used in the original cars. I spend a lot of time either looking for the original parts or trying to read works, um, books, and articles by people that race them in period to determine what components they had used on the original cars. So real quick, what are the three cars that we have right here? This car is modeled after one of the BMC Works rally cars. They built two. The registration number was XOH276 an XOH 277. 276 was a full Sebring Sprite with all the Sebring gear. The, the 276 was a 1958 November 11th build, I believe. Um, and this car is an early 58 car. It's about uh, several thousand different from the original car. But this car was built to replicate uh, XOH 276 that had run in the uh, Monte Carlo and the CSGR rally, and I believe the Alpine as well that year. The car still exists. The original still exists. It was restored several years ago by a gentleman in Europe. Uh, and we used pictures of the car in action in the late 50s and early 60s. It's uh, full C Sebring gear. We, we've done... Uh, I believe a, a reasonably good job of uh, replicating the original car. And before you guys get on us about a 1958 car having the wrong windscreen, we do know this is the wrong windscreen right now. This is a Donald Healy top, and we're trying to figure out how this would work with a 1958 windscreen. So this is just temporary until we get some of these things worked out on this car. Right, they used a number of different tops. They used the Donald Healy top. They had used a, uh, another top that was, we believe, sold by Speedwell that had been uh, manufactured for, by people that are, are no longer uh, manufacturing tops. Uh, we know the cars after about 4,500, serial number, used the Healy top with the later windshield. The cars with the nine stud windshield used a top that was sold by Speedwell. As you look at the early pictures, you can see John Sprenzel was running a nine stud car when they first started rallying. Then the cars just after that went to the later windshields and the Donald Healy top. So there was you know, the cars were transitioning in era as they changed screens and changed tops. The next car will be a, uh, this is 
what's called a Bonifil Sprite, supercharged standard steel body Sprite. This is patterned after the car 7080AC that was run by uh, Tommy Wisdom and Jack Hay in the 1960 Alpine. I chose that car to replicate it because I was interested in finding a, a historical car that had run with a supercharger that we had some good pictures of. We, we were fortunate we had some good pictures of the car in action as well as some good pictures of under the bonnet. We never did find pictures of the interior of the car, so we're guessing at what they might have had for rally equipment. This would be what a, a, a Rally Sprite 1960 running a blower would have looked like. We know that the top here does not fit correctly. This is actually a convertible top off of my iris blue bug eye that we took and put on this car just for the purposes of this video. We are, this is the car that I'm currently working on right now and I haven't made the convertible top yet for it. So this car actually ran with a black convertible top in the 60 Alpine. Um, we're, we're trying to configure the roll bar, the soft top, probably eventually another Donald Healy uh, style hard top. But typically we saw the cars running in Northern Europe, running with the hard tops. There's only the Targa that they ran as an open car. And there's actually pictures of this car running at Targa as an open car. We want to move on to the third car. This is representative of a Sebring Coupe, Sebring Sprite Coupe, as made by John Sprinzel. These were produced in 1961. They produced six of them, we believe. Everyone is just a little bit different, but they are a true alloy body coupe, fixed hard top. I had it built by uh, Creative Classics in the UK. It's built on a steel tub. It's got the aluminum coupe top, aluminum cowl, aluminum doors, aluminum rear shroud. There's aluminum inner fenders and the bonnet is fiberglass. We believe there was one aluminum bonnet made on one of the first ones, and then after that, they went to fiberglass. If you look at the original brochures from John Sprinzel Limited, they call for a fiberglass bonnet. So what, again, what we tried to do was replicate the way the cars were built. This car is painted up to match um, the way WJB 707 ran at Silverstone and Crystal Palace. And the goal is to get all these cars legal for FIA. That's correct. Uh, a year ago, October, we had the FIA inspector in to do the inspection in conjunction with the application for the FIA HTP to run under uh, Appendix K, which is the vintage uh, FIA regulations. So they've been inspected, the application is made, and we're just in the process of waiting for the return of the FIA HTP. And another difficulty we're running into is the FIA rules are different than the vintage racing rules here in the United States, which is where we want to do some testing of these cars before they're ever sent over to Europe so that we can get any major issues solved here. These are, are built to the homologation certificate. The red car is built to the homologation recognition form number 47, which was the form for the Sebring Sprites. This is built to that same form, but under Appendix J, you were allowed to adopt a special body shape. And the blue car is built to homologation uh, recognition form number 89, which was the form issued for the uh, supercharged cars. And you have shown this car both at Road America and you took it to the Healy Conclave two years ago. That's right, we took it up to South Dakota. It was the first time, excuse me, it was the second time it had ever been shown. We took it to uh, Road America up to Gather on the Green and showed it for the 60th Sprite anniversary. So it's been seen publicly twice. 
the red car's never been shown publicly and the blue car's never been shown publicly. And the goal is to possibly be taking the blue car in about a month to the Healy Conclave this year, which is out in California. That's right. We, they, they asked me to bring that car. Uh, we don't see many Schrock blown cars in the United States. It's a, a little bit different unit than, than most people have seen. So that means that I have a lot of work uh, ahead of me this next month and it's been slow going with these cars as well because Ken is very uh, meticulous about that we're using the correct vintage and era correct parts so that he spent a lot of time getting those all together and we'll go through more in depth and detail on each of these cars. So Ken let's talk about how this car looked when we started the project and also the car that this is based off of. Okay, this this car, the, the pair of cars I purchased in Arizona, one was uh, actually still on the suspension, the other one we had on furniture dollies. They had been largely stripped and uh, left out in the Arizona sun. They required extensive body work, and then of course we had uh, find uh, new old stock components to replace most of the componentry. This car replicates the Works, BMC Works rally cars. They built, there was two cars built, XOH 276 and XOH 277. 276 was built with a full Sebring Sprite package. 277 was a basic standard sprite. They occasionally switched the registration plates so you would uh, see 277 running in a rally as a Sebring sprite rather than as a basic sprite. The best way to identify which car it really is is we believe 276 actually ran with a fiberglass nose. When you look at the pictures of it, it doesn't have the seams in the nose, and it doesn't have the handle for the bonnet. And we believe that is the way 276 ran. We've elected to run it, to build it with a metal bonnet, um, and, and run it uh, that way to retain some of the originality of the car. Although we do have a fiberglass bonnet and we have talked about creating a correct fiberglass bonnet for this car as well. Yep, that's, that's one of the next projects is, is another modification as we find more details in the pictures and as we learn more information about the re original cars, we keep going back and correct and correct and correct. There's lists of, of different things that, you know, might be corrected or might be changed as we learn more about the cars. Uh, this is supposed to be representational of the 1959 appearance of the car. Uh, it ran three major rallies. So starting with the front of the car, we have modified the grill. We cut out each, uh, every other slat, and we've also got some Lucas spotlights on the front. Yeah, they're Lucas 576 back-mounted lights. They uh, drilled the holes in the bonnet and, and mounted them up rather than mounting them on uh, bracketry. Continuing in this area, we're required to put tow hooks on the car. So we've got tow hooks on the front and Steve's got one to show you. Yeah, tow hooks like this were available and these just bolt on to the uh, ARB uh, bolt area there on the front of the frame. But one thing that we ran into is we did not have enough hook area here to pass the FIA rules. So I drew these up in CAD and then had these water jet cut out and then I powder coated them here so that we would have a set that actually met the FIA, FIA rules that we have to meet with all of these cars. You can see that we're running the Dunlop period racing tires. We've got the uh, Dunlop style wire wheels that work alongside the gearling brakes and the uh, knockoff spinners. You notice that uh, Orson's nicely made up a little engraved Sebring emblem on the spinners for me. Uh, these are made up to the Donald Healy pattern. 
they're made by Orson's in the UK. They have the drawings for the um, for the hubs. They are fitted with the the FIA alternate for the uh, Gearling front disc brakes. They're a eight and a half inch front disc, and it's a 38 millimeter uh, diameter piston, and that meets all the specifications for the FIA um, Appendix K. And then back here, we've done something different with the door latch. Uh, one problem you would have if you had uh, side curtains, and especially on the coupe, which we'll look at later, there would be no way to easily get inside the door to get to the door release, which is in here. So exterior door handles are added to this car and as well as the coupe. Yeah, these were an option from Speedwell, one of the uh, performance accessory uh, companies available during the era. They uh, just attach back into the, the period uh, door latch and give you an external relief into the uh, car. This car is fitted with the Donald Healy Manufacturing Company hardtop. If you look at this hardtop in comparison to the standard BMC hardtop, you'll see that it gives you about another inch and a half rather than coming back straight at the uh, at the height of the windshield it arches up and it gives you a little bit higher clearance to uh, get into the car so, okay so here's a side curtain for the donald healy hardtop which uh you can see comes up and will fit inside of the hardtop and this side curtain here is a standard one you can see the height difference how much taller the Donald Healy hardtop is in the standard Sprite hardtop or the factory BMC hardtop. Then we come back to the rear wheel. These actually run on a um, wire wheel adapter. So it's a, it's a bolt on hub adapter to fit the wire wheels. And again, we've got the uh, spinner and the hubs from Orson's. That when the car was homologated, they didn't correctly state the track width. The stated track width is too narrow. The FIA gives you an additional inch of allowance, but what many people are doing is running the later Sprite midget wire wheel axle housing to meet the track width. The, alternatively, you can narrow the axle housing, but trying to meet the track width is is problematic because you're going to have to narrow something and we believe it's because there was a mistake made in the original forms this car does meet fia track width requirements and this one actually has a narrowed axle housing under it with the splined adapters with the oversized brakes and with the uh Dunlop, which is the uh, specified tire for FIA for this class of car. Okay, at the back of the car, of course, you can see the roll cage in the car a little bit better from this angle. We've got the uh, quick release, quick opening fuel filler. Which goes down to a fuel cell. Yeah, we've, we've put the mandated fuel cell in the car. You can see the cap is wired shut, which is modern safety convention. We have the toe eyes again. We've got toe eyes in the back. Yeah. Toe eyes of a certain area were required uh, for meeting FIA rules. So this is the toe hooks that we came up with to put onto the back of all of these cars. That's a uh, fuel safe cell we had built to fit the car. We've got a reverse light, which is an original Lucas uh, 494, I believe. Eventually we have talked about going to the twin pipe system as was used on the 1959 Sebring race cars. The dashboard elements we took from either period photos or from the original XOH 276. We flipped it right hand for left hand to make it a little easier in the United States. But the, the major elements came off the recent reconstruction of uh, 276. Starting from my side, we have a passenger horn button. We've got a how to speed pilot. 
These pieces of plexiglass are to deflect the defrost heat back on the windshield to try to keep the windshield um, a, little, a little more defrosted, get a little bit more heat. We've used an RAF map light. We've got a Lucas twin plug fitting here to uh, power accessories. Um, and then much of the uh, controls are, are standard Sprite controls. We've put some additional gauging in here. We have uh, oil clock, amp meter, We've got the controls for uh, twin fuel pumps uh, and the driving lights and the reverse lights. We're required, modern convention is we have the electronic uh, cutout. We've got that. One pe thing that people don't know about is what's called a fly-off brake handle. Typically, you'd... Uh, have to press to release it but this one to release you just pull and it'll release and so you press it to set pull it to release that's inverted from normal operation we've got a uh, Lempert uh, replica of the period wheels the steering wheels uh, modern convention uh, to give Steve a little help on the track as we've put the full width wink mirror up here so he can see down both sides of the car. We've got the replica of the 5 inch Smith's uh, chronometric tachometer. That was first used on the 1959 uh, Sebring cars and I like the looks of it and it's got the telltale in it. Uh, that's a modern electronic version. As I had mentioned, this car was known to have run in the Monte Carlo, which is run in the winter in Europe. And in fact, many of the rallies uh, in Europe are run in less than uh, sunny weather. So keeping the windscreens defrosted and clear was a big problem. I've already remarked about why they put the little plexiglass deflectors on them. But another way to uh, clear the windscreens it was an electronic heater. This is a Lucas, and you can see it's got a pair of suction cups on it, and it had clipped to the windshield, and uh, you'd have to get it behind the screen here, but it clipped to the windshield and plugged in to our auxiliary ports here to uh, actually heat the windshield glass, to de-ice and defrost the glass. It's just a steel bar, uh, chrome steel bar with a piece of nichrome wire, much like you'd see on the inside of the toaster. And uh, then you've got a simple on and off switch at one end and the suction cups, and you'd fit one or two on here to keep the screens clear when it was snowing and icing out. We've got several that we're getting ready to uh, put in the cars. We have to locate the, uh, the suction cups and do a little bit of rechroming work, but uh, that'll add another period element to the car. All right, let's show people under the bonnet. Okay, on the front, you can now see a better view of the front tow hooks here. And this here is not the standard anti-sway bar that you would see uh, fitted to later sprites or that you would buy out of a catalog. This is actually adapted from a Austin Healey 100 these eyes are parallel to the ground and the pins run vertically through them so you can tell that it comes from the, the from the big heelys we've got a vertically mounted oil cooler they actually used a tube and fin cooler and we're working on getting some of those built the interesting part of this is fitting it in this area uh, this is typically where you would see the inlet to the heater the engine displaces about 995 to 998 cc's. These were 948 in cc engines. John Sprinzel homologated them at not 940 cc as a base engine, but at 948 plus 20 thousandths. 
And that was the base. So when you took it out the allowable 40 thousandths of an inch, it actually became a 995 because it was a 948 overboard by 60 thousandths. We've replicated that. The FIA requires us to use the correct head. So that is a correct Sprite head rather than one of the later heads. It's been ported and modified. Uh, we, we have a, a fast road cam in here. Uh, we're not limited on the size of the valve, so the valve size is optimized. You can see that we've got the SUH4 carburetors. Those are the inch and a half carburetors, and they're mounted on an original Donald Healy manifold. Uh, I was very fortunate, one of the gentlemen here in uh, Iowa had offered me one of the original manifolds, and it was quite a nice piece to find. We've used the Malpasi uh, Filter King. It's a combination fuel filter and fuel regulator. Uh, in keeping with the idea that we want to keep dirt out of the uh, carburetors. Now, this has the gearling brakes, so instead of the monoblock that you typically see on a Sprite, there's split cylinders. There's a uh, brake cylinder, and a clutch cylinder, and then there's a, a spacer to stagger them. You see that they're not uh, parallel across the lids. They've used a little spacer to stagger them and get everything crammed into the existing pedal box. There are some modifications that were done within the pedal box. Length of the pedal above the pivot point with length was lengthened to give them a, a little bit different uh, throw. But in general, it's a, it's a plain Jane uh, early Sprite pedal box using the Gearling Master Cylinders. This car, this uh, wiper motor, has been converted to two-speed. It's a shunt-wound motor, so we put the extra resistance in it, and it's actually a two-speed wiper motor. A number of the books in the era talk about converting to the two-speed wipers, not so much for rain, but for muck on the windshield when they were running on, on bad roads uh, while rallying in Europe. We're required to run catch tanks on both the oil system and the water system in modern racing, and we wanted to hide the oil catch tank. It's required, we're required to have a liter capacity, and it's quite a big uh, can. So what we've done is we've buried it over here in the uh, offside uh, pedal box aperture. We built a can. Steve's firm built these cans that just drop right into the pedal box aperture and we can run our vent lines off the uh, cover and uh, the other side off the uh, fuel pump boss and vent it up in here and we don't have a big uh, can sitting in the middle of the engine bay. Uh, and, and another nice feature about it is since the bottom section of this ends up inside the passenger compartment we have a little drain port here that we can put a little valve on and so it's very easy from inside the footwell to drain the, the can between races. Yeah, and it, it just fits nice and it's nicely hidden. It's uh, re sort of obscure behind the heater and uh, we, we worked for some time trying to figure out how to fit a conventional can, whether we wanted to put it up where the heater box was or either either front or uh, left hand or right hand corner and we came up with that and I, I think it's a nice uh, a nice way to hide what's obviously a modern compromise of having to run cans which which weren't required in in the era um, we have a little bit more work in here to finish sorting it out other things we still want to do is it's known they were using a little bit bigger generator and we're trying to get those built. They used a, uh, you'll, you'll see the aluminum housing on the other voltage regulator, all trying to uh, get a little bit more amperage because they were running the lights, the wipers, the heaters and everything in a, in a car that was uh, 
a very simple car electrically, and when you started to add things, you, you could overdraw the circuits very, very quickly. All right, so we're gonna go to the Bonneville Sprite, and you see much the same up front. We've got the Lucas Le Mans headlights, the 576 spotlights. Again, we've opened up the grill to try to uh, get some more air in here. Uh, we've got the little supercharged badge. This is a modern reproduction, but there's evidence that Jeff Healy had some of those made up. So we, one of our friends has made them up and uh, I was fortunate to get several. The one thing that's a little bit different is we've got this little option up here. And uh, Steve's crew made it, this up for me and he'll tell you how they went about doing it. From the original pictures, the, the scoop looked very similar to this, but I didn't want it to look out of place on the car. So what we did is we took one of these headlight buckets and used that exact same shape to create the scoop here so that it didn't look out of place at all on the car. The airflow then comes through that scoop and drops into a, a cold air box that we have that we'll show you in a minute. You see that this car is fitted with the soft top, black soft top. This is the way we believe the car was fitted when uh, Tommy Wisdom and Jack Hay ran it in the 1960 Alpine. It does have the Gearling Type 10. These, these are the alternative to the Gearling Type 10 calibers uh, with the eight and a half inch discs on the front. These are Orson's hubs made up to the Donald Healy pattern. We uh, use we used modern hubs and Orson's does a nice job of engineering them to original pattern. It's a 38 millimeter caliber. One thing that's unusual is the caliber is fit on an adapter plate that bolts to a drum brake spindle. Sprites and midgets that you see fitted with disc brakes use a later spindle that was built for disc brakes. It's got the tabs to hang caliber on. That wasn't available when these cars were built. So they put an adapter plate in there, hung the, uh, the caliber on the adapter plate. We'll show you one later and, and take the wheel off and show you how it's fitted but they do not use the later Sprite spindles because those, those weren't available at the time. It's, it's been fun to learn about the Gearling brakes and how they're, they're built. There were actually five different brake systems known to have been used uh, on Sprites in the, in the era. This was the, the Gearling system was the only one homologated. They ran a Dunlop four disc four-wheel disc brake system at Sebring and then on the Falcon Sprite several times. But those are unobtainable. They, they can't be found. And they were very, very rare even in the era. This was the system that was homologated and this is, we're, we're trying to follow that pattern. Even, even the parts for this are now getting rare and it's harder and harder to find these, uh, these calibers, which are the approved alternate. We, we think that the FIA may approve a slightly different caliber, which will bring the availability back into the market. This car has not been fitted with a fuel cell yet, so it's, you can't see the fuel cell hanging underneath it, and it's got a uh, stock tight bug eye fuel aperture. We do have the bumperettes on it. Um, some of the cars ran with them, some didn't. Uh, one of the things they did in era that we're gonna do is they tended to put reflective tape on those so that when you were out at night running, uh, there was less chance of getting hit from behind. We've got another 576 Lucas light, back mounted light. This time it's with the uh, uh, fog light type lens and this is our reverse light. You see them frequently on the picture of the rally car. Obviously, it's been flipped right for left for use in the United States. We've also got a set of the tow hooks under here. And one of the things that we had to take in consideration when designing those tow eyes is the trunk floor actually sits up above the back curvature of the bodywork. And we were having a hard time trying to figure out how to design a good tow system 
that wouldn't end up damaging the back of the car. And that's why those toe eyes are so tall is to get us down below where we're not going to be damaging the bodywork if we do have to tow this car. All right, so we're sort of inside the little Bonneville and you can see much the same equipment. We've got the Lucas twin pl plugs for the uh, accessory equipment, whether you need to have a spotlight or another map light or whatever your navigator needs. We've got the typical gooseneck rally light, map light that the navigators used. Uh, this is a, a Halda Twin Master. We had originally planned on putting it down in the accessory panel and then realized that switching from a left-hand drive to a right-hand drive car, the layout wouldn't work and you'd tend to get your knuckles into the Twin Master while you were shifting. I apologize this dash isn't finished. We're still finishing it up so you see all the tape labels. But we've got provision for twin electric fuel pumps, all, all the standard Sprite equipment, plus a clock, plus oil temperature. Down here we've got the mandatory electric cutoff again. We've got an amp meter. And over here we've got a original Schrock boost gauge for the boost off the uh, supercharger. Again, we've got uh, reverse lights, fog lights, and the electric fan on the radiator. We do have a period picture of this car with an electric fan on the radiator. It looks like a very early Kenlo fan, very similar in layout. Again, we've got the six inch chronometric Smiths, an electrical, electric operated uh, reproduction. Uh, again, we've got the Lempert uh, replica of the original wheels that were used, a uh, Speedo and fuel. You can possibly see the loose wiring in here. We're still getting this wired up as we're trying to get ready to uh, go to California later. The passenger also has a horn button uh so that the driver can keep two hands on the wheel and keep going and the navigator keeps the people out of the road again this is set up as a rally car it's got more equipment than you might have in a race car many of these elements were in original rally cars and we've tried to put them in in, in ways that make sense to operate based on cars of the era or our friends that are uh, currently rallying in, in vintage rally events in Europe. All right, under the bonnet. And I am very much still in the process of putting this car together, so you'll see a lot of loose ends and bits and things not hooked up on this car yet. Yeah, we've, we've still got, uh, you can see what we've got here. We've got some of the wiring for the spots, the period uh, fan that we talked about, and I'll bring that out in a minute to show you. We're still running the plumbing to the oil cooler. Again, it's a vertical style oil cooler. This is a plate type as opposed to the tube and fin that they ran, but it's mounted in the correct position. Again, we've got the Healy 100 type bar with the bar ends parallel to the floor. This car is a later car, so you see the coil is down on the gusset plate rather than on top of the generator that you had seen in the uh, in the earlier car. Again, we've got the Bumblebee style Lucas Competition wire. Again, we've got one of Steve's uh, oil catch tanks mounted here under the uh, heater blower motor. You can see the vent line off the uh, rocker cover here and the other one goes over to the fuel pump boss. And then all of a sudden in the middle of the engine bay, you've got this big mass of aluminum. <clears throat> and what this is, is a Schrock C75 supercharger. It's, uh, you can see it's belt driven. It's got a pair of twin V belts that run down off the, the crank pulley. The air comes in through that vent that we showed you earlier, drops through the cold air box, is sucked through the SUH4 carburetor comes up this inlet tube into the compressor, is pressurized, it's, it's a vane type uh, supercharger, compressor, and then 
out through a log type uh, manifold and into the intake ports. We think it'll boost the horsepower by maybe 50%. We haven't dynoed it yet. They had problems in the era with boost, uh, whether you had to worry about too much compression, temperature, uh, fuel qualities. It's, they obviously they didn't run them later. It was, it was a bit of a temperamental beast, but it, it's quite a conversation piece. It's a, a fairly unique uh, looking piece of equipment. People are often amazed at how much room it takes up in comparison to the engine. Again, we've used uh, high quality engine components in it. I believe they're uh, Huffaker pistons. We use 1098 rods so we don't have pinch bolt ends on the rods. It's a Moldex crank. We, we use the bottom end of a former racing engine. And one thing that's different about this blower than other ones of this era is this does not have its own oil reservoir. This actually gets pressurized oil coming off of the engine and that is the oil that lubricates the supercharger on this one. We pick up the oil over on the uh, where the oil pressure gauge is. We put a T over there and uh, pick up the oil and drop it into the rear bearing on the uh, supercharger. So it's it's a little bit of a plumber's nightmare in here around the uh, distributor. We've got a lot going on between the ignition wiring and the oil feed line for the blower and the lines for the uh, cooler and remote filter. All right, I told you that I'd show you the fan we're going to use. The original pictures of this car, taken by John Phelps, shows what looks like a Kenlo fan mounted right about in this position. We found this fan and it looks remarkably similar to the uh, fan in the photographs. And so we're in the midst of uh, getting it mounted up. Obviously we, we have to have a mount that's stiff enough so the fan won't go in the rip into the radiator. We also have to clearance the bottom of the uh, inlet here so it doesn't catch on the fan motor. We do have the wiring to run the fan here but it'll be a nice, uh, a nice piece because it'll help us cool the engine and uh, appear correct as, as we know the car was. The period pictures of this car show the big Lucas uh, HF type horns. They'll mount, mount down this rail and this period we expect them back from the uh, repair shop pretty soon. The fan we found looks remarkably similar to the fan pictured on the 1960 car, mm -hmm. and and it'll it'll be a nice a nice piece. It'll cause some comments, we think, along with the blower and everything else that's under here. Yeah, Ken showed me a picture of what the original fan looked like, and I said, well, I've got one that looks remarkably like that back in my parts storage. I think if my memory serves me right, that this does have a couple more blades than the one in the picture, but this is very, very close to what they would have used. And if everything goes all right and I get this car uh, working, Ken is going to be taking this car in a couple weeks out to the Healy Conclave. So if you're lucky enough to be at that event, maybe you will see this car there and you'll be able to check out the, all these little details in person. Uh, we just keep pushing on and finding all the pieces and working at night trying to get it all bolted together. And this is the uh, last car that we're going to look at today, although this is not the last car that hopefully we're going to build. You have quite a few more cars in mind. Uh, in fact, the next car after these may be an American style race car that you're thinking about building. Yeah, we found a, uh, a Sprite that had been raced in Southern California that had uh, uh, a nice racing history and we're slowly accumulating a little bit more history on that car and it's uh, an interesting combination of uh, British parts and uh, Southern California parts so it, it it's a it's a different uh, a different flavor so far you've seen uh, a lot of you know the European uh, UK uh, rallying in Europe flavor so we'll build one that's a little bit different and uh, you know, e each one we do, 
there's, it's easy to think that they're all sprites. Each one has a different flavor that each one was made for a different purpose and each one, the original cars had a different history. So for me, you know, I'm kind of a history buff. I like delving into what the history of the car was and try to, I can't afford the originals. So I, I try to replicate the cars that uh, are of interest to me. So one that came from, uh, that had raced at Riverside, which doesn't exist anymore, um, is, is a fascinating car to build. And we've got that down here and, and we're gonna build that uh, in the next year or so. We've got a couple different things we wanna build. This one started from a bare tub, a bare chassis that I purchased in the UK. I was gonna send one of the other chassis over and uh, do it that way. And then some friends at CCK in the south of uh, England offered me a a tub that was there, and we had the body built up at Wollstone at Creative Classics. Again, the, the front end flavor is, is similar to the others in that uh, we've got Lucas Le Mans headlights, we've got the Lucas uh, 576 spotlights. We're, we're running a little different grill. We've just got a piece of grill work in the nose here to keep the stones out of the radiators. You see some of these cars ran with the full Sprite um, front grill on them, but a lot of them ran without the grill. And we kind of like the looks of it without the grill, so we made this up. We've got the tow hooks underneath. You can, you can see them down there. The FIA makes us put them on. Again, we've got the uh, Dunlop uh, L-section racing tires, the MWS replicas of the Dunlop wheels. We've got the Gearling brakes underneath here. Uh, we're going to show them to you in a little bit. These are, in fact, original Gearling brakes and Donald Healy hubs. Uh, the Type 10 caliber, the 8.5 inch uh, disc, and the Q-numbered Healy hubs. Again, we've got the uh, Sebring engraved that... Uh, Dave Woods at Orson's had done up for me. Coming back through here, this is a relatively primitive style spring type latch. Uh, a lot of people build these front flip bonnets with more extensive latching. This one I actually copied from what's currently on one of the original cars. This one's copied from WJB 707, and that's how. Uh, Steve Bowen had the car made up when they when they rebuilt the car. Uh, most of our pictures of period latches, so they were very, very simple latches, not the uh, more extensive me mechanism that you might see in, uh, in some cars. So we've tried to retain that style of, of simple lightweight latches. These are the uh, Talbot style mirrors. They're spun aluminum, very light mirrors. Uh, Speedwell door handles that we talked to you about earlier. This car uses a side screen completely different than the other cars. The side screen is obviously made to fit the coupe top, so it takes neither the standard BMC side screen nor the Donald Healy side screen. These were made up for me by Andrew at uh, Archer's Garage. As we move back along the car, again, we've got the bolt-on type uh, spline hubs. Again, we've got the uh, Gearling 8-inch drum brakes, the uh, MWS wire wheels, the engraved spinners. This car sits a little lower than the other cars. We've uh, shimmed the springs a little bit to bring it down. We still have to uh, track test the suspension a little bit and see where we want the car set for ride height and, uh, and how it's gonna ride. These cars rode much higher than you see uh, the, the modern uh, racing sprites that sit very low. They're down to uh, a couple inches off the ground. These cars ran higher and it's, and it's notable in the photographs. You can see a lot of room 
uh, below the arch cutouts. We've got the uh, flip opened fuel filler. This one has a cell in it. We've wired it shut as required. And even though the shape of the rear of this car is very similar to a bug eye, and this is all aluminum, this is not steel here, we chose to move the filler uh, up to this position to make a better shot into the fuel cell. Yeah, it, 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 trying to get fuel cells to work with the, with the bug eye, with the bend in the neck, and get everything to work, um, and, and some of the requirements on, uh, on how to uh, isolate the cell. We don't have the entire boot isolated as, as you have to in many bug eyes because we've elected to put the cell below the trunk floor. So to get this to be a little straighter to minimize uh, isolation problems, we ran it up a little higher. Typically this would be down in this area. We've got the same Lucas uh, 576 fog light mounted here, although you see this time it's mounted on the right side of the car because this car is set up as right-hand drive. This would be the configuration you would have seen on any of the uh, UK rally cars in the era. We worked very hard at getting the cage as high as we could into the top, not just to give us more height clearance, but to try to obscure the cage so it's not obvious that there's a cage in the car. We moved the front posts right out to the windshield posts. We moved the bar, the rear bar, out almost as far as we could on the side, but we have to put the diagonal in there. And another thing that's different, and sometimes they did this on these cars, is they actually brought the cutout for the rear deck back much further so that the cage doesn't have to penetrate through this top uh, layer of the sheet metal there. So you can actually kind of see where the original cutout was. And then this one has been brought back probably about six inches back from where it originally was. These are replicas of the Donald Healy seats. Um, they were made for me again by Andrew of Archer's Garage. Um, we chose the, the coloration to match the, uh, the proposed paint scheme. It might not be period, but it, it's what we chose, and I, I think it came out real well. When we looked at these cars, when we looked at pictures of them, we noticed that uh, many of them that were built as pure track cars had just a short abbreviated dashboard just in front of the driver. John Sprinzel's car had a full dash. You have to remember, John uh, was the, the consummate rally driver, and we think his car was more uh, designed for rally driving than pure track driving. I like the look of the full dash, full width dash. I think it gives me a, a more finished looking car. So we elected to go with the full width dash. I don't know whether you can see it from the camera angle. We've got a 120 mile an hour speedometer rather than the uh, typical Sprite speedometer. This was made up for me uh, by uh, Peter over at Nossinger's and they made it up with the correct lettering and the correct uh, configuration, but it's made to 120 mile an hour speedo. This is a period Speedwell Western electronic tack. These were just introduced about the time that these cars were built. This one was sold to me by a friend of mine. Uh, we actually have a uh, gauge face that goes to 12,000 RPM. We believe it had come out of a BRM race car. This is a 8,000 RPM gauge. Working across, we've got the standard dual gauge. We've got a clock. We've got the amp meter. We've got twin fuel pumps fog lights, um, reverse lights, etc. the mandatory cutoff. We had to move the fuel gauge. You'll remember the typical Sprite fuel gauge sat over here. I've mentioned several times that we had to accommodate, make accommodations to historical layouts to fit modern safety equipment. One of the uh, alterations we had to make was to move the fuel gauge because we brought the uh, column the post, if you will, for the uh, roll cage down through the uh, through the dash along along the windshield post. 
I also had mentioned before we used a smaller uh, steering wheel because if you use a full size steering wheel you end up with your knuckles in the roll cage and, and the, it's just too much of a safety risk so we uh, went with a smaller wheel. We do have the wink mirror. We've tried to bring it up as high as we could to hide it uh, under the front uh, edge of the uh, upper edge of the uh, windscreen so that it's uh, sort of obscured to outside viewers. It uh, gives Steve a uh, full view of the track behind him. Okay. One thing that's interesting in here, those of you know that know sprites real well know that there's a stiffener that runs in here through the floor. To try to get the seats lower, what we've done, and CCK did this for me in the UK, they've cut the stiffener out of the top side of the floor and flipped it and put it underneath. So there's still a stiffener in here, it's just not on top of the floor, and that allows us to bring the seats a little bit lower. We could still go a little bit lower by pulling the uh, the tracks and, and running the seat straight to the uh, straight to the floor, but it gives us a little bit more room. We gain about three quarters of an inch of uh, room to uh, lower Steve's height in the car and get the uh, center of gravity a little bit lower. So we just pull the spring clips and roll the bonnet forward. We do have a leash on it to keep it from going too far forward. Okay, this is a very similar layout to what you saw in the red car. We have the uh, remote oil filter. We've got the cooler. Again, we're running the vertical uh, C-Trob cooler on the right side of the radiator. We've got the Bumblebee style Lucas wire. The Gearling pedal box is mounted on the right-hand side because we've, we've developed a, a right-hand side drive car. You can see the split master cylinders. Um, this one uses a pole type starter. We may eventually go to the uh, other type starter solenoid. I've got some people in Europe looking for the correct cast housing um, starter switch to go there so that we can get a correct period item. This has got the SUH4s. Uh, one thing interesting about these is these have a short neck in here. It's very, very hard to get clearance on the, bo on the bonnet if you don't uh, have a short neck on the uh, damper rod. And so uh, there, there's a number of different configurations on these. If you look in the uh, SU catalog, they identify the short neck uh, dash pot for the uh, H4s. Um, these are original Speedwell inlets here. We've used the uh, Malposi Filter King, combination of fuel uh, filter and fuel regulator. We've put one of Steve's um, catch tanks in the offside pedal box aperture. You can see the uh, vent hose off the uh, rocker cover and the vent hose coming up off the uh, fuel pump boss. This one's running a conventional fan. We're still with the stock voltage regulator. Uh, ultimately, we'll go to the, the three bobbin regulator. We're still with the uh, Lucas C39 generator. Eventually, we wanna go to the 22 amp uh, C40 generator. This again is the uh, 948 overboard about 60 thousandths. We're at about 995 to 998 cc's. We are running smooth case gearboxes in all these, but they're fitted with the uh, gear ratios from the uh, later Mark II Sprite, which was the uh, alternate homologated gear ratio. They're not a straight cut gearbox. The straight cut gears in that ratio are not available. Most of the pictures show them without a heater, so we've done that. There's also a little interference. You have to, if you try to run one of the uh, gearling pedal boxes, the Smith's blower motor, you have to alter the, the foot bracket, the foot mounting for the, for the motor to bring the motor up to clear the side of the pedal box a little bit. Um, 
so it's it's not a bolt-in installation although we have the kit made up um, should we decide to uh, run a heater in this car it's it's all made up and ready to go there, there's still things I want to correct on it to make it a more correct to a period car but we've, we've put a lot of effort into to trying to get it pretty close again we have uh, done everything to get the FIA HTP on it so we could uh, run this in Europe uh, in competition eventually. All right, we're gonna start at the front end of the car again. Again, I'm gonna show you the toe eyes, how we have them mounted to the, to the front chassis legs. And we had to enlarge them to cut that opening to uh, meet FIA requirements. These are commercially available but you, you can't get the eye opening big enough to meet the FAA, FIA requirements. So we've made them up ourselves. Again, this is the Healy 100 roll bar or anti-roll bar. And you can see the characteristic parallel to the ground surface on the eye end with the vertical pins. Another interesting thing to note is the early sprites, the a-frames, the A-arms, were not drilled for the ARBs. The ARB was not a uh, offering, so you can identify early uh, A-arms as the ones that are undrilled. Look at the eight and a half inch discs and uh, see how they're mounted to the uh, drum type uh, spindle or, or swivel axle and uh, see how that's fitted in there. We'll take one down in a minute and show you how that is. You notice also we've got a uh, oversized oil pan in here to uh, pick up a little bit more volume without dropping it and losing road clearance. I've got 500 pound springs up front. They're a little bit shorter. We don't know quite where we're gonna go with spring length yet. Uh, my friends in Europe recommended this spring rate. This is a, a replica of a, a Speedwell XM5 header. It's a tubular header that Speedwell offered, and Manny Flo made those up for us. And these are original 15 leaf Sprite springs. We'll probably restack them. I, I expect we'll take at least two leaves out of them to. Uh, take some of the stiffness out of it. In, in the back here, and we'll show you in a minute, these are the Gearling eight inch by inch and a half width uh, drum brakes. So you get uh, an extra inch in circumference. Well, it's actually an inch in diameter is what you're getting. And an extra half inch in width. So you pick up quite a bit of uh, braking surface from the stock seven inch by one inch with Lockheed drums that were used on the car from the factory. Okay. Of interest back here are the Armstrong 22 click adjustable shock absorbers. These are uh, called out in the uh, specifications for the Sebring cars uh, that ran in 1959. The, the uh, famous uh, Sprite victory at Sebring, Florida. They went one, two, three with these cars in 1959, and they use these 22 click adjustables. And you have a set for all of your cars. Yeah, all the cars are fitted with them. We hope to be able to tune the dampening to whatever spring rate we eventually end up with. Another thing that might be of interest to those of you from the racing community is there is no uh, panard bar in here or similar arrangement. A panard bar was not listed as an option in the uh, original homologation. So we can't put anything in for lateral stabilization. So you can have some shift uh, side to side with the axle because you don't have anything to, uh, to uh, make it rigid to to center it and uh, that that's a problem if you try to compete with this car against a car that has a uh, counter or another system 
uh, I've been told just don't even try to get away with it uh, through an FIA scrutiny process that they weren't part of the original equipment and I can't add them. You, as Steve pans out, you can see the fuel tank. We dropped it a little bit, added a little bit of uh, depth to it to get a little bit more range out of it if we were to rally this car or run a little longer event. Uh, again, it's a fuel safe. It's, this one is fitted with uh, twin internal pumps. The pumps are in the tank. The cars in period rallied with uh, twin pumps, but they mounted them inside the cockpit on, on the side of the rear fender well. We, we obviously don't want to put fuel pumps in the car and, and try, to, try to run a, a twin piping system right in the cockpit. And then again, we've got the tow hooks in the rear and we've dropped them. You can see from this angle that the, the lower edge of the rear shroud comes down quite a bit from the boot floor. So you need a, about an inch extra of clearance so that if you run a tow cable in here, you won't be uh, getting into the rear shroud. We don't have an RC40 mu uh, muffler on this, which is the common muffler to run in uh, competition now. We've just got the little uh, Sprite muffler on it. So we got the wheel off here. What I wanted to show you is this is one of the Gearling Type 10 calibers. This is the uh, caliber that was homologated in period. This is an original. And we've showed you before how it's mounted to the uh, drum brake swivel axle with an adapter plate. These are Donald Healy hubs. And if you come over here for a little close up, you can see the Donald Healy Q number cast into them. This is one of the original discs. What we use nowadays, what you can use is a Spitfire disc cut down to eight and a half inches, and that'll work. Um, so it's, it's not impossible to build one of these systems. The, uh, the alternate is a GM ATE uh, caliber off a uh, Opal or a Vauxhall Estate, Carlton Estate. And they're getting more difficult, but there are alternatives if you can't find the originals. Some people have said that a Sebring Sprite is simply a Sprite with disc brakes. Because you remember, the first Sprites were all drum brakes. This is a piece that really made this car part of what made it a, a very competitive car on the era. And this is what's fun for me uh, as far as learning about historic cars is what was going on engineering wise, you know, and how rapidly we went from a, a you know, a, a Le Mans car, a basically a prototype car, to all of a sudden we were able to get disc brakes on what was supposed to be a very cheap every man's sports car. We're at the rear of the car now, and I told you earlier that these were bolt on uh, wire wheel adapters. And so you can see the adapter bolted outboard of the, of the drum brake. Again, uh, we'll get this uh, oriented so you can see the Donald Healy uh, Q number on it. But these are original Donald Healy equipment. These are the Gearling drums. And where they've been sourced recently is it's the same drum brake that was used on the Riley 1.5. They're an eight inch by one and a half inch drum. And uh, I'm gonna show you the difference in drum size here. You can see an eight inch drum and a typical Sprite seven inch drum. And you can see the difference. We use different wheel cylinders than the Riley to uh, match the booster we have. So you have to change the bore on the wheel cylinders, but it's a standard uh, Gearling HL3 drum brake. Well, Ken, thanks for letting uh, me share your cars with the audience at home. And one thing that you alluded to uh, when we were filming this video, but I don't think we necessarily stated, is your plan is that I'm going to be the one testing these cars and then possibly racing the cars. You had attempted to get a racing <laughs> license at one point and 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not a racing driver. Steve's a racing driver. I have a, a great deal of fun trying to build them, trying to make them period correct. Steve's a, a great driver. I admire that his cars aren't banged up and beaten up. And I, I think it'll be a lot of fun for, for Steve to drive them and for me to get the uh, enjoyment of seeing them on the track. So that's a plan is uh, we'll take them out and see if we can get them perfected and see if we can put them on the track. It, it'll be fun. It's, it's an interesting experience to actually try to build a race car from what was a basic tub and starting from scratch and trying to build it as a, a historically accurate car. And so whether we're successful at racing or not, the idea that we can build a car that actually meets FIA Appendix K and um, is, is somewhat historically correct, that's a challenge. You know, it's, it's sort of part of the game. You know, my part of the game is I want to build the cars. I, I want to build something that at least replicates what a car actually looked like in history. And if people in the audience uh, have suggestions, uh, I'd love to, to have any suggestions on any changes. Um, and, and we'll keep working on them. And it's going to be a never-ending process. We're going to keep finding things that we want to fix or things we want to modify, pieces we want to improve, or pieces that are more accurate historically. And, and that's my point. That's what I want to do, and, and Steve might get to drive them a little bit. So the plan is that hopefully later this year we'll be able to take one of these cars out, start uh, getting it on the track, working out the bugs with it, uh, think, seeing what things we need to change, and uh, we'll bring you along with us when we do that. So thanks for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, comment below and click subscribe.